So today's video is going to be part two of the Lululemon case. If you haven't seen part one that I uploaded two days ago, you probably need to watch that one first, so I'll link it up here. You've got plenty of time. We're all in quarantine, so open another tab, go watch part one, and then come back here for part two. It'll all make so much more sense. But for those of you that have seen part one, I'm just gonna give a quick recap of what happened, and then we'll just get straight into the rest of the case. So Jana Murray and Brittany Norwood were both employees at a Lululemon store in Maryland, and they were both on the closing shift this one night in March of 2011. They both closed up the store, everything was normal. They set off home and then realised that they'd both forgotten something in the store and so they both came back to retrieve them. However, the next morning both women were found still inside the store. Jane and Marie had been murdered with 330 wounds in her entire body. Brittany Norwood, on the other hand, was beaten and tied up. However, she had survived the attack. She was found still breathing, taken to hospital, and she recovered. Brittany told police that two men in all black had come inside the store as the women were leaving, grabbed them, demanded that they give all the money in the cash registers, they stole all of that, and then they took the two women to the back rooms where they brutally beat, raped, stabbed them, and murdered Jaina. After checking the CCTV footage from outside the store that night, police did see two men dressed in all black walking by the store around closing time, so they believed that they were the suspects. Now it was just finding out who these men were. Police questioned a load of people, they had suspects including a homeless man, they did a stakeout mission and everything. But these men on the tape were found to be just some men on their way home from work like they did every day. So they weren't the suspects. And now that this CCTV tape proved that it wasn't going to be very helpful in the case, police decided to go back to the case file and just look over everything again, refresh their memory right from the beginning. But now they were going back through all the evidence, they were realising more and more things that were sticking out to them that just didn't seem right. Things just weren't adding up about this attack. And that is where we left the last video. So now let's talk about those things that were sticking out to police. First of all, the attackers hadn't brought their own weapons. They hadn't brought guns, they hadn't brought, you know, knives or anything. They were just using things that they found inside the Lululemon store. The Buddha statue, the toolbox, even the zip ties. Police found a stack of zip ties around where the toolbox was kept that were the exact same zip ties that we used to tie up Britney. So were the attackers just banking on Lululemon having zip ties? They didn't bring anything to tie the girls up with. They didn't bring anything to like, you know, open the door with. The Lululemon store wasn't supposed to be unlocked because this was after closing time. They were just lucky that the women had left the door unlocked. At the very least, if you're gonna rob a store, you're gonna take like a crowbar or, you know, a hammer because it had a big glass door, they could have even smashed through the door. So how could the attackers have known that there were zip ties in there? And plus it would have probably taken them a while to look around the back rooms to find the zip ties and to find the toolbox. Stuff like that doesn't have a designated place, like if you were looking for a knife maybe, then you could bank on one being there because every kitchen has a knife, but not every you know, shop has a toolbox and zip ties and you wouldn't know where to find it in every store either. As for the amount of weapons, like I said, there were a lot of different wound patterns on these women, so a lot of different weapons were used. All the things from the toolbox, Buddha statues, there was a random rock lying next to Brittany. So that's a lot of getting up and going and finding a new weapon and then returning to the victims. There was a lot of empty time between the attacks, you know? So while the attackers were trying to find this toolbox, the women were just, what, sat there in the back? And while the attackers went up again to go and get these Buddha statues from the front, they were leaving the women alone for a long time between the attacks. When surely, if this is a robbery and you've just stolen all the money from all the safes and all the cash registers in the front of the store, you're gonna wanna leave as soon as possible. You're not gonna go to the back and then just torture these two women. You're not gonna prolong this attack and go out and find new weapons every two minutes to use on these women. You're gonna be getting out of there as quick as you can. My main point of this being, and the weirdest part of this being, is that the killers didn't take their own weapons and everything that was used in the attack 
was already in the Lululemon store. No one had to leave to go and get anything, no one had to bring anything to the store. But just going back to that idea of them leaving the victims alone in the rooms while they went out to get more weapons, this is kind of off topic but I had to mention this somewhere and I, I didn't know where so it fits in here. This attack to strike someone 331 times it will have been going on for a long time. This was not a quick murder. So calculated at one blow per second, the attack will have lasted at least five and a half minutes. But one blow per second is very fast. When you think how many there is, 330, this person's arm is gonna get tired, they're gonna get fatigued. And of course, the changing weapons and stuff, like I say, they're gonna have to put one weapon down, pick another one up. Changing that to one blow every three seconds, that means the attack would have lasted at least 17 minutes. Pathologists believe that Jaina was alive right up until the last blow. So she was being attacked for at the very least 17 minutes and she was alive through the whole thing. And 17 minutes is a long time for one person to be in such a, you know, blind rage. So it takes a lot of anger to do this and I just don't think a random attacker that was there to steal money had this much anger in them. Another thing that didn't seem quite right to police were the prints in the blood. Like I said, they identified two different shoe prints in this blood. A smaller one that they believed could have come from one of the women and a larger one, the size 14 men's Reebok trainer. But when you think about it, there were supposedly four people in this store, the two women and the two attackers. So why is there only two sets of footprints? It makes sense if maybe Jaina was already dead by the time there was enough blood on the floor to be kind of trailed around on people's feet because she wouldn't have been walking in it. But there would have been at least three. There were two men and there were Britneys. And while we're on the topic of those size 14 men's Reebok trainers, police were speaking with the store manager, Rachel, and just telling her everything that they'd found and they said that they'd found these trainers. And she was like, oh no, don't worry about those. Those are Lululemon property. And so police are like, ha hang on, like what? We thought that these had been ditched by the attacker. What do you mean they're store property? So Lululemon actually have two pairs of trainers that they keep in the store for when people come in and they wanna try stuff on, but maybe they're not wearing the right footwear. And obviously Lululemon sells workout gear. So you're always probably gonna be wearing trainers when you're wearing Lululemon lemon clothes. So if someone comes in and say they're wearing like heels or something but they want to try on some yoga pants, Lululemon have these two pairs of trainers that they can lend to people to try clothes on with. And the reason they're size 14 is because that's like one of the biggest <laughs> shoe sizes you can get. So at least it's gonna fit everyone. So now police are even more confused because why would an attacker coming to the store change their shoes, put on the store-owned shoes, and then walk around in the blood and make some prints and then leave. Maybe there's the argument that the attacker put on the shoes so that their own footprints wouldn't be in the blood so that couldn't get pinned on them. But at the same time, how would the attackers know that those shoes were there? If these men were just coming to rob this store, how would they know that there was a size 14 men's trainer there for them to put on, you know? And another thing that didn't seem quite right to police right from the beginning, and something that I know a lot of you guys picked up in part one, was the differences in the injuries between Jaina Murray and Brittany Norwood. Jaina Murray suffered some of the worst injuries I have heard in my whole three years of doing this job. I report crimes all the time, 330 wounds, I've never heard anything like it. She was beaten and stabbed to a point where her body was unrecognisable. Whereas Brittany Norwood had a few scratches on her and a few, you know, bruises, a cut on her forehead. Most of her injuries were superficial. Two of them weren't, which we'll get into in a minute, but only two of them required stitches or bandages. The rest of them were literally just cleaned and they would heal on their own. So there is a huge difference between what the attackers did to Jaina and what they did to Brittany. It just seems very unlikely that the same people would do both. If you're gonna go so hard on one person, 
you're gonna go so hard on the other person. You're not gonna do completely different attacks on two people in the same store. And you know, going back to those statements from the Apple employees who were in the store next door to Lululemon as this was going on, they said they heard a lot of noise. Specifically, they said that they heard two women's voices, which was very troubling at first, but then police realized that they never mentioned a man's voice. And didn't Britney say that her attacker was shouting racist things at her and racial slurs? Surely the people in the Apple store would have heard that if they were hearing the women talk. And if you remember, Britney said that the guy attacking her knew her full address and was saying her full address to her, which seemed as though he had specifically targeted Britney and done research on her and stuff. It was as if the attackers had chosen this specific night to carry out the attack because they knew that Britney was working, which would make sense until you remember that this attack took place after closing time. So Britney wasn't even meant to be there. They had already closed the store and they were supposed to be on their way home right now unless Britney had forgotten something. So if these men, these attackers, had been following Britney and decided to attack her when she was at work one night, why would they choose to do it after closing time? It seems unlikely that an attacker would do this much research on someone, find out their home address, find out where they work, and then not find out the times that they work and go to attack them when they're not supposed to be somewhere. And again, thinking back to those Apple employees hearing two female voices and not a single man's voice, if she said that this person was saying her address to her, surely the Apple employees would have heard that, but they didn't. So now police are thinking, well, was Brittany Norwood in on this? Maybe she had let her attackers in, after closing time, showing them where the shoes were, you know. Maybe she showed them where the weapons were, showed them where the zip ties were, and then volunteered to be a part of it to make it look real. So police wanted to know a little bit more about Brittany Norwood and her private life, just to kind of get an idea of the person she was, the people that she hung around with, you know, see if there was any indication that she could do something like this. And police quickly learned after speaking with her family and, you know, people that she knew in college and stuff like that, that Brittany had a lot more to her past than just a couple of petty thefts. I mean, there were a lot more petty thefts than police were aware of. So, for example, when Britney was in her teenage years, she did quite a bit of babysitting for this one particular family. And as time went on, as Britney was babysitting for this family, they noticed more and more pieces of the mother's jewellery going missing. On top of that, they found out that she would even steal or kind of scam or cheat her own friends out of money. So she had this roommate a while back and Britney was always the one to pay the rent. The friend would send her half to Britney and then Britney would pay the full amount. And at one point, Britney told this friend that their rent had gone up by a couple hundred dollars a month and so she needed to start sending Britney more money. And this friend did, but the rent hadn't gone up at all and Britney was just pocketing that extra money every month. And this was her friend that she lived with. Police heard from a local hairstylist in that area that Britney had once cheated her or scammed her out of a full set of hair extensions. And these hair extensions cost a couple hundred dollars. Stuff like that isn't cheap. A full head of hair extensions plus styling is a lot of money. This stylist said that she was doing Britney's hair and everything was fine the whole time up until it came to pay and Britney realised that all of the cash in her bag was gone and she accused someone in the salon of stealing the cash from her bag that she was gonna pay for the hair with. And because the stylist felt bad for her, she thought that one of her other clients or one of her employees had stolen this cash from Britney, who was her client, this stylist felt really bad. So she said, oh no, don't worry, just get the money to me, you know, in a week or so, like I'm really sorry that this has happened in my salon, that you've been robbed in my salon. However, the weeks went by and Britney still hadn't paid this hairstylist, so she messaged Britney on Facebook and Britney just blocked her. 
So we can probably tell that her money wasn't stolen and she just never intended on paying for that. Another very interesting thing was that they found out that Britney had lied to her friends about graduating college. She never graduated, she never got her degree, she never walked in the ceremony. She was actually kicked out of college in her last year. I believe probably for the stealing thing and she also had pretty bad attendance. But she told her family that she had graduated from college with a degree in sociology and psychology psychology and she was just unable to walk in the ceremony because she had outstanding student loans. Looking further into Britney's past, police found out that she had actually had a boyfriend when she was in her mid-twenties. He was a bit older than her. The two of them were fine for a while until they just decided to split up. You know, things weren't going as well as they were in the beginning so they split up and he found someone new and Britney did not take this well at all. Britney began texting him and his new girlfriend. I don't know how she found his new girlfriend's number, but she was texting them both. They both blocked her number. She found a way to contact them still. And then at one point she even broke into this man's house and stole a bunch of his and his new girlfriend's things. So that's electronics, just random belongings like clothes and earrings, stuff that she liked to steal. It got so concerning that this man actually filed a restraining order against Brittany Norwood that she actually violated on a number of times. The earliest violation of this restraining order was just two weeks after it was filed against her. She lasted two weeks until she was parked outside of his office staring at him through the window. And that evening she actually followed him home in her car from his work back to his house. Police also continued working with the Lululemon staff to try and like figure out what kind of person Brittany was when she was at work. And Rachel, the store manager, said that she'd actually abused her staff discounts on a number of occasions. And bear in mind, Brittany had only been working at the Bethesda store for six weeks at this point. So one day a year, Lululemon has this crazy discount for their employees, where their employees get 70% off of everything in store up to a cap of a thousand pounds, just so that they can buy all the new leggings and stuff like that and wear them on shift because I think they have to wear Lululemon when they're working. Like I said, the employees have this 70% discount up to a cap of a thousand pounds. However, Brittany asked for an extension on hers just because there were a couple more bits that she wanted. She was so new to the store. She had to, you know, buy a full wardrobe of Lululemon. And so the manager let her do that. She was like, you can go over by a little bit, but not too much more. Well, Brittany went over the cap all the way up to £2,000, double what she should have gone up the cap by. Like, imagine how much clothes you can buy for £2,000 with a 70% discount. Like, she rinsed <laughs> that discount. I mean, it's not necessarily criminal, but it just shows the kind of person that she is, that she's willing to take advantage so much. But the most interesting thing that police found out from Rachel, the manager, was that Jane and Marie and Brittany Norwood didn't actually get on at the time of the murder. Brittany had been suspected of stealing from the Lululemon store. So an odd pair of leggings here or there. She'd also been suspected of stealing from co-workers, so like a bottle of perfume out of someone's bag in the back room. And it got to the point where a meeting was held with the people higher up in Lululemon. So that's Rachel, the store manager, and Jana. There were a few people in this meeting and they all talked about what they were gonna do about Britney Norwood because this was a problem. And they basically said that if they caught Britney stealing from the store one more time, then that was it. Like she was fired. So the next time anyone saw or suspected anything with Britney, they had to share it with the rest of this meeting. And then a few days after the meeting and just the day before the murder, Jane and Murray rang Rachel and said that she suspected Britney of stealing once again. So Lululemon has this strict policy where at the end of every shift, each employee has to check another employee's bag to make sure that they're not stealing anything from the store. It's company policy, no one ever has a problem with it, you know, it's just people get on with it, people understand, and no one's ever stealing from the store, so it's not a problem. However, on this day before the murder, Jane and Murray thought she'd seen Brittany Norwood put a pair of yoga leggings in her bag without buying them. So she went over to Brittany and she was like, oh, do you mind if I do the, you know, routine bag check? 
on your bag and Brittany was like oh no someone's already done it today it's fine and Brittany even gave the name of this other co-worker that had supposedly checked her bag so Jaina was like okay so she goes and checks with this co-worker that Brittany claimed had checked her bag and this co-worker said no I haven't checked anyone's bag so far on this shift now at this point in the case the forensic tests of Jaina Murray's car had come back and a lot of Jaina's and Britney's blood was found in this car, which police kind of half expected if one of their killers, one of their attackers, had driven this car to this parking lot, they expected to find the women's blood in there. So that wasn't the suspicious thing. But one thing detectives weren't expecting to find in this car was a hat with blood on it. But this blood was in a very specific location. It was on the inside of the hat, right at the front, right in the middle, kind of where it would sit on someone's forehead. And who, in this case, had a huge cut on their forehead that needed stitching up in hospital? Brittany Norwood. So now police are thinking maybe Brittany was working with these attackers. You know, maybe she had driven this car away while they were killing Jaina, just so that she could hide the car. So police called Brittany Norwood back in for some more questioning. They didn't make it clear that she was a person of interest. As far as she knew, they were still just asking questions as if she was 100% a victim. So police asked Brittany where Jaina's car was parked that night after she came back to let Brittany in and Brittany said it was parked right outside the Lululemon store. And then police asked Brittany if she knew what kind of car Jaina drove and Brittany said she had no idea. So now police are wondering how that hat with the very specific blood staining on it had gotten in the car because it was obvious that it was from Brittany because she was the only person with an injury in that Place. Police then asked her about the zip ties that were used to tie up her wrists and her ankles and she said she believed that one of the men got them out of his backpack. And then at this point police just decided to confront her with this one tiny little thing and they said well those zip ties that you were tied up with matched the ones at the Lululemon store. They matched another stack of zip ties we found in the back. And then Brittany kind of backtracked on that and she was like, oh, well, I, I don't know if he got them out of his bag. He might have got them from the store. It was all just really blurry. And it was at this point during the questioning that Brittany said that it was all getting a bit too overwhelming for her. She was still very affected by what she'd gone through that night and she just asked if she could leave and detectives let her do so because, you know, she wasn't a suspect. But, you know, after this questioning, their doubts had only grown in regards to Brittany Norwood. They were very suspicious of her at this point, and so they began looking into her as a potential suspect. Going back to Brittany's injuries, you know I said she had two major injuries, the rest were superficial, but these two required stitching and like bandaging and stuff. There was the one on her forehead and then another one between her finger and her thumb, so right here. Police got experts in to look at this injury on her hand and from a physics point of view, this injury was consistent with a blade. So like tightening your grip on a blade as if maybe you were holding one and you dropped it and then you went to like grab it again that is how she would have gotten that injury. So maybe the weapon was slippery with some kind of substance, i.e. blood, and maybe the blade slips through her hand, her hand tightens on the blade and it cuts her. But why was she holding a weapon? Remember, her hands were tied up the whole time. How could she have been holding a weapon? And why would her hand have been moving with so much force that the blade would slip? And then that injury on her head was consistent with a kind of bash kind of movement. But it was in a very strange place. If someone's gonna hit you over the head, they're gonna aim for, you know, not the very top center of your forehead. And it was theorized at this point that maybe she had been kneeling with some kind of weapon in her hands here, going like this to someone, and then just maybe pulled it up too far and hit herself in the head. Eventually, everything clicked in Detective Reuven's head and he decided to gather around his full team of all the detectives that had been working on this case and present his evidence. Never once did the footprints in the blood leave the store. They were all found in the store, plus the shoes. The shoes never left the store. All the weapons were found inside the store, nothing ever came in or left Lululemon that night. He stood there in front of his full team and said, I believe no one ever came in or left Lululemon that night. I believe that Brittany Norwood murdered 
Jaina Murray. And now it was all making sense. The difference in injuries. Jaina had so many injuries and Britney had two major injuries along with a lot of superficial ones. And you know I said Britney claimed that she had been raped by her attackers and she'd done a rape kit in the hospital. Well by now the results of this rape kit were coming back and they showed negative. Britney hadn't been raped. So police decided to bring back in the forensic expert. He'd been working on this case the full time. He was looking at the prints in the blood and everything. And they decided to bring him back in and they said, look, this is our new theory. We think that Britney may have murdered Jaina Murray. Can you now go back and look at this crime scene evidence and tell us if any of that forensic evidence points towards our new theory? Because obviously this wasn't something he'd looked for before. He was looking for evidence of two attackers, two large male attackers. So now that his focus was shifted to maybe evidence of Britney being the attacker, maybe something new would come up. So this forensic expert asked to see the zip ties that were around Britney's wrists because obviously if you're tying your own wrists with a zip tie, you can't do it with your hands, you're gonna have to do it with your teeth. And he said that if Britney had tied the zip tie around her own wrists, they should see some teeth marks, some like little dints in the zip tie. And guess what they found? There were teeth marks in the zip tie around her wrists, but not around her ankles. So it seemed as though she tied the one on her ankles fine, and then the one around her wrist, she had to use her teeth. And even just the angle that her body was found in, like I said, her arms were tied there and they were above her head. Why were they above her head? Even if someone else had tied her wrists together and put them above her head, once that person had left, she could bring her arms down from under her head and put them in front of her, which would be way more comfortable than keeping your arms all the way up there for hours because this attack happened at the night time and they weren't found until the next morning. Why did she just keep her arms above her head for hours? Uncomfortable. It was just obvious that the way that her body was found was all posed and it was all for effect when it was found. Another thing that this forensic expert noticed was there was obviously a lot of overlap when it came to the footprints in the blood. Naturally, people that are, especially in a struggle like this, the footprints are gonna be all over the place. Some of them are gonna overlap. However, one thing that he noticed was that it was always the larger footprints overlapping the smaller ones. There was not one instance on this whole floor where the smaller ones were on top of the bigger ones, which just would not happen naturally. It was as if the smaller ones had been made first and then maybe someone had changed their shoes, put the larger ones on and then made the large footprints. So now they're looking back at the crime scene photos and especially looking at the ones of Britney since they're now suspecting Britney and they're looking at these blood pools, blood puddles around Britney and they're thinking how on earth were they made? Because now that she's had all her injuries checked over they realise that most of them are superficial. She could not have possibly bled enough to have made those blood pools that were found in the bathroom. So where has that blood come from? They notice now looking at it that it looked more kind of smeared than it did naturally pooled as if it had like dropped and leaked into that position. It seemed as if it had been wiped into that position, you know? And then police remembered that in the room where Brittany Norwood was found still alive with these blood pools, they'd also found paper towels soaked in blood. And it just all made sense. Maybe she had soaked up these paper towels from Jaina's blood and then taken them into the bathroom and smeared them on herself, smeared them on the floor to make it look like she'd bled more. And looking at Britney's wounds, all these superficial cuts and stuff that had happened on her body, looking at the angle at which these had been made, it seemed as though she'd done them to herself. I don't really know how to explain this very well, but the angle that they were done at just wasn't a natural angle for a, an attack. And it just so happened that just as police were having all these realizations, they're beginning to suspect Brittany, Brittany Norwood herself comes into the police station and tells police that she's remembered something about that night and she wants to tell them. Previously, Brittany had said she'd never seen Jana's car before and she had no idea where it was after the attack. But now, Brittany had come into the police station and said that the men had forced her to go through Jaina's belongings, her bag, her jacket, find her car keys, get in her car, 
and drive it away. Drive it a few blocks away and then walk back to the store. They told her that if she so much as opened her mouth on the walk back to the store, that she could consider herself dead. So Brittany is telling police that she drove this car three blocks away, she was three blocks away from these attackers that had just killed her friend and that she thought could kill her too. She drove this car away and then voluntarily walked back to them. I don't want to say like, why didn't she just keep on driving or why didn't she just go to a police station because you don't know what kind of thought processes you're gonna be having in that moment. But at the same time, how on earth did you drive two blocks away from the people that could have just killed you and then you're just gonna voluntarily go back to them? You're in a car, you could just carry on driving. You could just drive and drive and drive until you see a police officer or see a police station. She even told police that on her walk back to the Lululemon store, she saw a police officer and she didn't say anything. So police are sitting there and listening to Brittany Norwood tell this story about the car and they're just thinking, what a load of, you know, lies. She had probably gone home after she told police that she didn't know what Jana's car looked like. She'd probably gone home and remembered she left the hat in there and thought, oh my God, how am I gonna explain that? So now she's come back to police and said, oh, I didn't wanna say this before, but you know. And the police officers didn't make it apparent to Brittany but they didn't believe her at all. They they told her that they believed her and they told her, you know, thanks for telling us that information. But on the inside, they're thinking, no matter how scared you are, if you see a police officer or if you're three blocks away from your attackers, you're gonna try and escape, you're gonna try and flag someone down, you're gonna try and go to safety with this police officer that you've seen. So the officers that had just been questioning her and listening to this, they went off into another room for a second and they just said like, look, I don't believe what she just said. And the other officers are like, no, I don't believe it either. We should confront her right now. So they go back into the room and they sit down and they say, look, Brittany, you've just, you've got to tell us the truth. You've got to tell us what is going on and she just starts crying and she's getting defensive. She's saying, I've told you everything. I've told you what's happened. And the officer that was doing the questioning said, no, what you've done is you've created this huge story that is starting to not make sense and we're starting to find holes in it. So this police officer sits in front of Brittany and just starts telling her all the evidence that they've got, that her wounds are self-inflicted, the way that she was laid with her arms above her, the bite marks in the zip tie. And Brittany just goes very quiet. She doesn't say anything. And then once he's finished reeling off all this evidence, she just says in a very timid voice, can I go home now? And really, Brittany could have left because she wasn't arrested. There was nothing keeping her in that police station, she'd gone there voluntarily. However, police use this tactic whenever it seems that, you know, a person wants to leave but they want to keep them there, they want to carry on questioning them, they say, right, we'll take a break, can you just give us a minute? So the police officers will leave the room for a few minutes, they'll talk about what's just happened and then they'll go back in and they'll just carry on the questioning with a new question and kind of make the person forget that they'd even wanted to go home. So they do exactly that. The police officers say, can you just give us a minute? They go out and when they come back in, they bring her brother and sister in. Her brother was named Chris and her sister was named Marissa. And they say, do you just want to talk to your siblings for a bit, you know? And they hoped that by bringing her siblings in, Brittany would see the kind of effect that this was having on her siblings, like emotionally. If police started reading out all this evidence again, with her family in the room, maybe she would be more likely to just break and confess. So that's exactly what they did. Police began going over all this evidence again and it was really getting to Britney's sister, Marissa. Marissa got really emotional. She broke down, she started crying and Marissa had to leave. So police said to Britney, they were like, do you want just a minute alone with your brother and we'll go you know, speak to Marissa and make sure she's okay? And Britney says, yes. So police leave and in this kind of questioning room there is just Brittany and her brother Chris. Some sources say, so I don't know how true this is because I only saw it on a few sources, but some sources say that Brittany was worried that the room that they were in was bugged and it was being recorded or filmed or whatever. And so she got her brother Chris to kind of look around the room and make sure there were no cameras. And he said, no, I can't see anything. It's, I think we're fine. But of course, this is a police station and this is a questioning room. Everything is recorded. So the whole audio and the whole video was being recorded this whole time. So her brother Chris just sits next to her and he says, look, 
if you've done it just tell me I need to know if you've done it you can't go through this by yourself like I'm not going to go and tell the officers but you need to tell me so then we can sort this out and we can move forward and at first she's denying it she's saying no I've told them everything blah 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 and he asks her again and he keeps asking her and she says I don't want to talk about it here which is pretty much a confession isn't it if you hadn't murdered someone you're gonna keep denying that until you die but the fact that she stopped denying it and then said i don't want to talk about this here was enough for police they then believed that Brittany Norwood was guilty. And with that, on March 18th, 2011, exactly one week after the murder of Jana Murray, Brittany Norwood was arrested on suspicion of murder. And when Jana's family found out that an arrest had been made, they were really happy. But then when they found out it was Brittany Norwood, they were just really confused. Of course, they were relieved and they were thankful that this had been solved and someone was being brought to justice, but this was Brittany Norwood, her co-worker, the woman that up until now, they had believed had gone through such a traumatic experience with their daughter. They really sympathised with Brittany Norwood. They were going to send her flowers in the hospital, but they never ended up doing so because, of course, her wounds were so superficial that she was literally out the same day, so they never got around to sending them. But Jana's family really felt bad for Brittany because she had gone through so much. She'd watched their daughter die. And now they're finding out that she was actually the one to do it to her the whole time. So now police are trying to figure out a potential motive as to why this ever happened in the first place and like a sequence of events that led up to the night where Britney just snapped. The most likely scenario that police thought could have happened was that Britney found out that the Lululemon staff were onto her stealing and maybe she found out that Jana was a part of that. She'd been in these meetings about her. Maybe Brittany had lured Jana back into the store late one night after closing so that she could talk to Jana about it one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe, I don't know what she was planning to do, maybe she was planning to murder her or maybe this was just a talk that led to an argument, that led to an assault, that led to a murder. Maybe Brittany just wanted to threaten and intimidate Jana and say, look, don't don't take this theft report any further. But maybe Jana already had, maybe she told her it was too late and then that's when Brittany snapped and began assaulting her. If you remember what I said in part one about Brittany's job at Lululemon only being temporary, she actually had an interview at a gym just a couple of days after this incident where she was interviewing to be a personal trainer there. And maybe Brittany thought that if Jana took this theft report any further, then she might not get the job at the gym in a couple of days when she goes for her interview. Maybe Brittany only intended to scare or hurt Jana. Maybe she didn't intend to murder her. Or maybe she did. I don't know because Brittany has never really talked about this very openly. So we don't know what her exact intentions were when she lured Jana back that night. All we know is what she did end up doing and that was brutally murdering her. So before I get on to the kind of court proceedings and everything, just an interesting little fact. In the seven months between Britney's arrest and her first appearance in court, in that seven months all the phone calls that she had out of jail were all about her looks. So she was telling her like friends and family that she was stressed that she can't have her hair done or have her nails done. Anyone else would be if they were innocent, they would be saying like, get me out of here, like I haven't done this. That would be the focus of most of the calls. But hers are more over the fact that she's going to prison and she's not going to be able to get her hair done. I just thought that was quite interesting. So Brittany gets herself a defence lawyer. This man is called Mr Wood and he is looking over this case and he's thinking, there's no way I can argue this. There's no way I can say that Britney is innocent. There's just too much evidence against her. She's obviously guilty. So the way that he decided to go about this was argue that Britney Norwood had some sort of mental disorder or illness that had gone undiagnosed. It had been dormant this whole time until something that night had brought it out. He said that no sane person could ever do what Britney did to Jana. 
No one who was in their sound mind could ever do that. So there must have been something wrong with Britney. He argued that this couldn't have been premeditated. It must have been a snap in that moment in Britney's mental health. It couldn't have been premeditated because Britney left a trail behind her, a very obvious trail. For example, when she lured Jaina back to the store, she actually called around all her co-workers trying to get Jaina's number so that she could call Jaina and lure her back to the store. Whereas if this was premeditated, she would have probably made sure she had Jaina's number in advance. Maybe she would have got it during her shift that day or something. So it must have been last minute after the closing time of the store that she decided that she was going to do this. And while I don't want to comment on the premeditation of the crime, because I just don't know. I don't know what I believe. Was it premeditated? Was it not? I honestly don't know. But what I am going to say is that I think Brittany Norwood was very mentally ill. Of course, I'm not excusing a single thing that she did. She was a disgusting human being and this crime is horrific. However, there is clear signs that she is mentally ill. For her to strike someone 331 times and not get tired and just continue in this blind rage, there is something wrong in her brain chemistry. Like I said, this crime was going on for at least 17 minutes. In 17 minutes, any, you know, mentally sound person's brain will tell them to stop. Britney's didn't. She is clearly mentally ill and that is not an excuse. I'm just saying it is probably very true. Not only that, but she then went and took her victim's blood rubbed it all over herself, tied herself up, and then went and laid in this bathroom for hours until someone found her. She was just laid in her victim's blood and then she turned on the act. Extremely mentally ill. Also, just think back to that boyfriend that she had that time when she was stalking him and breaking the restraining order and stealing from him and stuff. Like, those were early warning signs that this woman was mentally unstable. And that was all the defence really had to argue on because it was obvious that Britney had done this. So now they just had to try and get her the lowest sentence that they could by saying that she was mentally ill. Now, not that the prosecution needed to do this, but they brought forward even more evidence. Even after they arrested Britney, they were still finding more evidence as to why and how she'd done this. The prosecution said that Britney had definitely moved Jaina's car that night. Jaina had parked it in front of Lululemon and Britney had realised it was still there and gotten rid of it by the time morning came. But they said that the reason Britney did this, because it would make sense if Jaina's car was still parked out front the next day because obviously she'd passed away. How else was she going to move that car? So it would make sense for the car to still be there, but Britney felt that she had to move it because their store manager, Rachel, actually lived across the road. So imagine if Rachel had woken up in the middle of the night or gone to her window before she went to sleep that night at say 11 o'clock and saw Jaina's car still outside Lululemon. She would think something was wrong, maybe she would go across the road to go and check on the store and maybe she would find Britney in the act trying to set up this fake crime scene afterwards. Brittany realised she had to move Jaina's car so it wouldn't alert Rachel if Rachel did see it. But then she realised she had to come up with some kind of reason, some kind of excuse as to why she did that, why the attackers made her do that. And that's why she went to police a few days later and said, oh, I forgot about this thing. She never forgot about it, she was just still trying to make up the story in her head. So police believe the sequence of events goes like this. Brittany lured Jaina back into the store, some kind of altercation happened, maybe an argument that led into an assault that led to Brittany murdering Jaina. They said after that, Brittany then noticed the car out front, she drives it three blocks away and then she walks back to the store where she then begins to stage the crime scene. So she's smashing stuff, she's knocking stuff over, she takes all the money out of the cash registers and stuff, which I don't know if they ever found all the cash. She gets the men's size 14 shoes, she stands in Jaina's blood and then trails it all around the store. She then stages her own crime scene. She goes and grabs some of Jaina's blood on these paper towels, takes them into the bathroom, puts it all over herself, puts it all over the floor. She gets the razor out, she cuts herself a few times, she hits herself on the head with this rock or whatever, and then she zip ties her ankles and her wrists together and then puts her arms over her head. So now the jury had heard the full case, they went to deliberate and they were deliberating for not even an hour. 
less than an hour and if you've heard a lot of these cases you'll know that less than an hour is no time at all they were certain that they knew what had happened so the jury came back and they said that they found Brittany Norwood guilty of the murder of Jana Murray. The judge sentenced Brittany Norwood to life in prison without the possibility of parole because this woman was clearly such a danger to the public. She was very mentally disturbed and the fact that she could do this, such a heinous crime, such a brutal murder, 331 wounds over a pair of leggings shows that she should never be left to roam the streets again. Before she left the court, Brittany Norwood gave this huge like, I'm sorry I feel so bad kind of speech to Jana's family. Honestly, I just believe she gave that speech just so that she had a higher possibility of getting parole, just to make it seem like she was remorseful. But you know, if she was really sorry, she would have given herself in. She wouldn't have tried to cover it up. She wouldn't have tried to frame two random men for so long and carry on with that story for so long. She was clearly, you know, she wasn't sorry. And just to finish this case off, a nice little fact to end this off is that that Lululemon store in Bethesda is still there in that shopping district and there's actually been a mural put into the windows. So before this it was just all glass windows but now the top part of those windows is like a mural dedicated to Jana Murray and it says love in some like ceramic tiles and it's really nice. And people go and leave flowers and like cans of Dr Pepper and stuff outside of there. I think Dr Pepper was probably a favourite drink. That's what I'm assuming from hearing that. But yeah, that completes this video. Thank you so, so much for watching. Thank you for watching both parts. If you've watched both parts up until now, that is insane. Thank you so much for your time. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you leave a thumbs up down below and subscribe if you want to see some more from me because I'm planning on making so many more videos now we're in lockdown. If you want some lockdown entertainment, I volunteer. Thank you so, so much to all of my channel members on both tier one and tier two for their support with the channel. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.